Hey everybody, this is Robert from Black Belt Gaming. I hope you're doing well. It's time to make another video in my first edition Advanced Dungeons & Dragons series. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about something that is often discussed, sometimes debated, and that is combat. And what I thought I would do is before I take a look deeply in the books and go exactly by the book as closely as I can, I thought I would talk to you about the way that I learned to play first edition combat. And it isn't by the book, but it's kind of within the spirit of the game, I think. And I think the guys that taught me how to play were coming from uh, basic D&D &D or original Dungeons and Dragons uh, into advanced. I'm, th I'm guessing. But uh, let me tell you about how we played first edition AD&D combat. And I thought I would do this through some specific examples that I remember. In first edition AD&D combat, one of the very first things that you do is determine if uh, either side or if both sides are surprised. Uh, this is a rule that I don't think that I ever saw used when I was learning how to play. Instead, uh, surprise was determined by the dungeon master and not by any die roll, but by the scene, by the setup. So let's take a look at the doppelganger from the Monster Manual. This is a creature that's, um, that actually has a special attack called Surprise on a 1 to 4. Um, according to the rules, when you roll a d6, you're surprised if it's a 1 or a 2. But a 3, a 4, a 5, or 6, and your party is able to act normally. But uh, doppelgangers are very good at surprising people. And I don't know, perhaps the dungeon master, maybe they were taking these things into account. But no die roll was made. A doppelganger. Um, I remember still feeling like a, a newer player to the game. But I had played at least a couple of sessions. Uh, I was in a different adventure, and there was a different DM. And the scene was we were in an underground dungeon. As I said, we typically played one-shot adventures on the weekends. We were uh, underground and had entered this, uh, this room that had recently seen battle, or had recently been the scene of a battle. And... There were dead bodies scattered throughout the room. They weren't they weren't necessarily piled up on top of each other, but there were, I would say, five or so dead bodies scattered about. Towards the center of the room, the dungeon master described that there was a uh, an elf whose body was kind of contorted, and I remembered the dungeon master kind of bent backwards and put his arm down and curled up his leg and said that the uh, the dead elf was was laying on top of a um, was lying on top of a, a glowing sword um, this giving off this faint glow and so that immediately caught the attention of our party, you know, oh, magic sword, treasure. So one of my friends uh, approached the body of the dead elf and said he was going to roll the body off of the sword and carefully take a look at the sword without touching it. So he was somewhat of a more experienced player than I was. I, I probably would have gone over and just picked it up. <laughs> But uh, as soon as he touched the body of the dead elf, the dead elf jumped up and attacked him. And it was actually what you see here on the screen, if you can see, is a doppelganger. 
uh, this creature attacked him. And there was no die roll made. It was an automatic surprise attack. And it was only one attack. And it attacked him. And so the way that I was taught to play was if the scene had the creature surprise the characters or ambush the characters, then it was kind of an automatic thing. Um, no die roll was going to get them out of that. So any advantage you might have to rolling well and avoiding that surprise, you didn't have it. The monsters got the automatic first attack if they were in sort of an ambush situation like this. So the doppelganger attacked and uh, grabbed him and immediately assumed my friend's form. So they looked identical. And the doppelganger had uh, inflicted damage on my friend. So this is really the first part of combat I wanted to discuss with surprise. But there's something else that happened in this battle that's another component of, of combat that I thought I would talk about. And that is um, targeting. Targeting when you have multiple opponents or targeting when you're making a ranged attack into melee. And that's what this was. My character drew his bow and arrow and was going to attempt to shoot the doppelganger. But they were engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. My friend and this doppelganger were just right, you know, clutching each other's throats. My friend was already uh, being choked, and then it looked like my friend was choking him back. And so the dungeon master asked me what I was going to do. So it kind of also bleeds over here into initiative. How does initiative work? We typically did not roll initiative. It was usually determined on the description and who got the first attack, you know, who surprised the other side. And as I said, that wasn't even done with a die roll. Initiative was simply done by back and forth and back and forth. We took turns it kind of actually resembles more of what you see in more modern games, even though there is a, a more modern versions of, of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, but they do typically roll for initiative. I'm not saying that we never did, but it was rare. And in this instance, uh, the doppelganger had attacked my friend, and now it was our turn. And so my friend attempted to attack back, but failed. And then it was my turn. And I was going to shoot it with the bow and arrow. Now, a, a combat round in first edition was uh, about a minute long. So you can imagine these, these two uh, fighting each other for a while, and I'm pulling out my bow and getting my arrow ready. And the dungeon master said, what do you want to do? And I said, uh, I'm going to yell out, What's the name of the inn that we stayed at last night? And then the dungeon master uh, my, looked at my friend, and my friend said the name. I don't remember what it was, but my friend said the name. And then the dungeon master immediately repeated that and parroted him and copied him. And so I asked the dungeon master, I said, which one said that first? And he said, the one on top said it first. Or did he say the one on the bottom? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm getting confused. Let's, let's say he said it was the one on the bottom that said it first. Then I was thinking about it. And for some reason, I got confused. The, the, the dungeon master gave me a perfect window of opportunity to attack the right target and to choose which target I was going to shoot. And I chose the other one. I said, well, I'm going to shoot the one on the top. Just because I had it in my mind. I don't know. I, I'm still confused to this day if he was on the bottom or the top. But I chose the wrong one. And I shot and rolled my attack, and I hit my friend. And I think I nearly dropped him because he was badly wounded, and the, the doppelganger came over and rushed me next. 
and I don't remember exactly what happened with the rest of the fight, but there we have it. Uh, we didn't roll a die to randomly determine the target of the arrow. I clearly had a choice given to me by the dungeon master, and I chose the wrong target because I overthought it. I thought about it too much and confused myself. So I shot the wrong one. I think what happened was, now that I'm trying to remember, I think he described it, and I had already assumed that the doppelganger was going to be in the the top attacking position, but it actually was reversed. So the image I had in my mind didn't fit with with what he said, and I think what he said was my friend was actually on top and choking the doppelganger back, something like that. And I went with what the image was in my mind. And, you know, that's another thing that we didn't use miniatures. We didn't use miniatures. We didn't use drawings. We didn't use uh, things like that. We did map the dungeons on graph paper, but we didn't use miniatures in combat. Some of the experienced players brought miniatures, some that they'd even painted, but uh, it was just sort of to enhance the game or add a little inspiration like, hey, this is my character. And that was, that was like the neatest thing ever to see one of those little miniatures. But um, it wasn't actually used on a grid or uh, on the table to show positioning or anything. They, they, the guys never used that. So anyway, I shot the wrong one. Totally my fault. And uh, that's how we were handling things like surprise, initiative, and random shots. We, we just didn't follow those rules. Okay, so let me talk with you a little bit more because it's not like the monsters were always getting initiative on us and getting this surprise attack. Uh, just as often, uh, we were given the first attack. It, it really balanced out. In fact, I feel like that we were given the first attack most of the time. The dungeon master, and I'm sort of assuming here, but the dungeon master sort of understood that we were usually entering the, the lair of the monster or the dwelling of these monsters. And we were the ones with our weapons drawn and, and uh, you know, bows ready um, spell components in hand, and, and we were the ones that were there surprising the creatures who didn't expect us to enter their domain. And usually the initiative or the surprise attack was given to us. Basically, we started the combat. So, uh, if you can see the screen here, I have a bugbear. Let me tell you about the first time we encountered one of those. Actually, the very first time I as a player ever encountered one of those. Uh, not just my character. But I remember our party, and there were at least three of us. We were in this large chamber. And it was the same adventure. I may have talked about this in a previous video, where there was this um, chamber, and there was a, like a pool like a, a deep pool of blood in the center of this chamber. And it was real slick around the edges, and there were different hallways heading off from this uh, central chamber. And I, I feel like I talked about this one a little bit when I was talking about the cloak of the manta ray. I think I did a video on that. Anyway, it was the same adventure. Uh, and my character was uh, a head and checking, sort of scouting out, scouting ahead down one of these uh, hallways that connected to this bloody pool. The dungeon master told me that I could see down the hallway, and it was a kind of a lengthy hallway, and down at the far end was a torch, and it turned off to the right. But he said between myself and that torch was a hulking figure approaching my position. He said it, it was uh, tall, it had broad shoulders, kind of a big head, and 
there was something like an elephant trunk waving back and forth to the right and to the left over its head. And the dungeon master put his arm up in front of his face, uh, almost as if he was imitating an elephant, but with a trunk upraised. And he was waving his hand back and forth. And so at this description, I remember all the other players and myself, we just looked at each other thinking, what, is this an elephant you know, a half elephant, half man creature. What is this approaching? Is it a demon? What is this? And so, as the creature entered into the torchlight of of ours or lantern light or whatever we had, uh, he said it was a bugbear, and I had no idea what a bugbear was. I, I was imagining some sort of cross between a beetle and a cave bear, but I knew it was big and it was dangerous. And he said the bugbear was clutching a human leg that had been sawed off at the hip. And this, this outstretched leg was clutched in its, its hands and it was chewing on the muscles in the thigh. And it was feeding on this human leg. And that's what was waving back and forth over its head. Kind of a really neat description that all threw us off and, and really pulled us into the scene. And... Even though this creature came out, and again, you can see on the bugbear's uh, statistics that special attacks, it surprises on a 1, 2, or a 3. That means if I were to roll the dice to determine surprise, it, it would have a 50% chance to surprise us and get a, uh, a surprise attack before initiative is even rolled. But once again, that's not how we were playing it. This thing probably should have surprised us, but it was instead shocked to see us there. It certainly didn't expect to, to find us in, in that terrible chamber. And so it looked shocked and kind of dropped down the, the leg from its mouth, which I think it used as a club later. But the dungeon master asked me, what do you want to do? And then combat started. And we had the initiative. We basically got the surprise or the jump on him. And we attacked first. And then it, then we took turns. Very, very simple. Just based on the description of the scene. Also, I remember the way these guys played. It was super simple to bring new people into the game. Because it didn't require any kind of rules mastery, they could, they could actually sit there without a character sheet, uh, although we all had them, but just have never played before and, and almost just kind of slide into the game and just describe what they're doing and, and get, get, get a hang of it. Even something uh, like combat, which, you know, in, in AD&D first edition carries a reputation of being quite crunchy so very simple uh, just the way it was described we took it from there and if the dungeon master said what are you gonna do then you know the the surprise or first action was ours we could run away we could slam the door we could jump into the pool <laughs> whatever we wanted to do but we attacked this thing Another uh, quick one here before I go to the initiative example was we were playing with um, a different DM, the one that had been DMing for that doppelganger. I wonder if this was even the same adventure, but I remember he was the DM. And our little group was uh, in this dungeon underground. We were trying to be real quiet. We approached a door, listened for noise, didn't hear anything, were able to quietly open the door and peer inside, and we saw an acolyte, a young cleric, sitting at a desk. There were candles all over the desk, pieces, pieces, uh, pieces of parchment, you know, papers everywhere, and he was writing something down uh, into, into this book. And... Uh, the dungeon master said it, it was uh, wearing a, a hood with its robes and 
the hooded face turned in our direction and looked at us. And he, and he said, <clears throat> he said, what are you going to do? Well, right there, we had the opportunity to charge and, and make an attack or shut the door and run away or whatever. We didn't do anything. We looked at each other thinking, all right, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? I don't know. Do you want to go first? I, I don't even know if we were speaking, but we hesitated. And as players, we hesitated. The dungeon master then said, too slow. The acolyte picks up the mace off of his chest, raises it up over his head, and charges you while yelling at the top of his lungs. And, and he attacked us. So we lost the initiative. We lost that window of opportunity uh, because we hesitated. So once again, when I described before that first edition was player skill, uh, a bit more than character abilities and character skill, this was another example of just the way we played combat. Uh, thinking quickly, making decisions, being decisive, uh, making smart choices under pressure, uh, those made a difference in our games. So we lost the initiative there. Our fault. Okay, one more example. And I hope I haven't rambled on too far already. But one more example was when we did use initiative. And I remember being shocked that we did it. Because I just wasn't used to seeing us do that. Our party. We, we were with kind of our, our number one DM. The guy that DM'd my very first game. Our party was um, in an underground cavern we were exploring. Can't remember what we were there for. But we had our, our group. And most of the other players were experienced. And I was still very new. And I'd, I'd played at least a game or two, but was still pretty new. And... We came and encountered, it may have even been a random encounter, a wandering monster. Uh, we encountered another party of adventurers. Basically treasure hunters, right? So we didn't want to share, they didn't want to share. So negotiations, uh, the conversation broke down. And combat was starting. And I remember the dungeon master said, we have to roll for initiative. So, um, my friend who was about four years older than I was, he, he had actually constructed his very own dice tray. It wasn't a dice tower, it was a tray. And it looked like a little bowling alley. He had a little row of dice at the end in this, in this groove and he could pick a, a die up and toss it down and it would bounce off the sides and down the center and hit off the wall at the end. He had this homemade dice tray uh, and he rolled for initiative. And the one thing that I also remember along with the die roll for initiative there to determine which side was going to go first was I remembered the spell casting particularly in this moment. Um, in the player's handbook, in the player's handbook, uh, there is, which actually came out before the Dungeon Master's Guide, there is a, a description here about spell combat. And it talks about how, unless it is spell versus spell, many spells are going to happen near the end of the melee round. So you're probably familiar with uh, the rules and, and how there are segments and different spells have different casting times. The DMs I played with didn't use that. Instead, they seem to go by the spirit of this paragraph here and spells would typically go off at the end. The, the casting part would start at the beginning, but the spells would fire at the end. And so it was almost regardless of who won the initiative roll. But if we go back 
and spell casting during melee here in the dungeon master's guide it actually talks uh, even a little bit down here in some more detail about what you can and can't do about you can't walk around you can't be pushed or hit or have your spell disrupted in any way or it's lost what I remember here is the other adventuring party had a magic user and the dungeon master described how he was pulling spell components out of his satchel uh, placing them in his hands between his fingers I can't remember what they what it was started to say the arcane words and making the gestures and he was obviously casting a spell and in front of him almost like a line of linebackers in an American football team uh, the other group was ready to intercept and, and stop any of us that may attempt to charge and, and attack. So I think we won the initiative roll because I don't remember the other fighter types advancing on our position. I remember they were taking more of a defensive position around their uh, magic user. And I can't remember if that's because it just wasn't their turn yet or what. But um, remember, in a round, both sides get to go. We were able to act first here because we won, won, won the roll, I believe. But I remember the most experienced person, uh, player, on our, in our party, he looked at us and said, we've got to hit that magic user. We've got to disrupt his spell. Whatever it is, it's not good. So do you have any ranged weapons and you know we immediately began checking our our character sheets and looking to see if we had a dagger to throw or if we had a bow and arrow or anything like that and so unfortunately i don't remember a lot that happened after that i, re I just remember that part of it the sense of urgency that we must get that guy we must hit that guy we have one chance to do it before they get to act and I think what was going to happen was we would take our actions the other side would take their melee combat actions if they were to take them and then at the end of the round uh, spells would go off and let's say if one of our guys was casting a spell and we'd won the initiative he'd fire first and then the other guy would fire his spell so spells happened at the end to kind of just lump them all in the category of spells take a while to cast and we're not going to count segments we're not going to worry about that we're not going to worry about weapon speed factor we're not going to worry about um those types of things you know measuring distance and all that we didn't we didn't do that sometimes we want we may want to ask you know about how far away am i that kind of thing but we weren't using miniatures on a map and we weren't uh, counting the seconds or the segments uh, in the combat round like that so we didn't use those rules and just if you're curious we also didn't use the um, weapon versus armor type so there were quite a few combat rules weapon length and all that that we just didn't pay much attention to <clears throat> because it would slow down the game but as I became a more experienced player, I became more interested to add more of those things into the game to see how they worked. And I have some interesting experiences about that that I may talk about uh, another time. But that's, that's how we played combat. Uh, no surprise rules, no initiative rolling, unless it was just dead even. We were face to face. Nobody had the jump on the other guy. It just happened at the same time and we had to determine by the die roll who actually got to move and attack first or you know charge or whatever was happening and uh, that's how we did it and the last little bit about spells spells were not counted by the segment but just went off at the end of the round so some people may say Robert you weren't really playing first edition advanced Dungeons and Dragons 
And I can see your point. But to me, it was. It was a great way to play. And in my closing comments, I'll, I'll say, I'll let you know why. So just uh, in closing, what I'm kind of amazed when I think back on the way we played the game, and, and combat is a big part of Dungeons & Dragons, what I remember is how much, how mature we all played at such a young age. Out of character, before the game started, we were, we were your typical kids. Um... But once we started playing and the game started to unfold and the stories were being told, uh, the adventurers were uh, on their quest and, and we were meeting the horrors <laughs> that, that, that dwell in the dungeons, we became really immersed in the games. And what the dungeon master said, everybody listened to. I don't remember anybody having a turn and somebody else uh, stepping over and playing a video game or running out of the room and getting something to eat or whatever. I, I just, you know, we didn't have cell phones or anything all the way back in the 80s, but um, we all paid attention, very close attention to what everybody said because needing player skill it was very important to work off of what they said. And sometimes it was even important to react to it in a, in a, in a, uh, in a quick, you know, expeditious manner. We, we, we needed to, to respond quickly and efficiently. Uh, or if we were stumbling as a player, then basically our character was stumbling and hesitating. And so I think that's one thing that made the game so special uh, to me and so memorable. The, the reason I have these memories is because the way we played them, uh, the way we played the game together, uh, it just really pulled everyone in so strongly. And it kind of tested uh, our ability to respond and puzzle solve and and uh, handle things under uh, pressure. And as you know, AD&D 1st Edition is a pretty deadly game. And perhaps on another uh, video, I'll talk about some, uh, even some house rules, some even home uh, brood creations that some of the uh, early Dungeon Masters played around with that were actually pretty fascinating that uh, I'll let you know in a future video. But that's what I wanted to talk about today, so I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments below, if you don't mind, how you started to learn 1st Edition Combat. Did you really learn it all by the book? Because uh, I kind of hear that a lot of people didn't. A lot of people played almost a more basic version of the game. But um, anyway, love to hear from you, and nice to make a video again. Take care, everybody, and I'll catch you later.